want to show you guys I'm pretty excited about is right behind me, uh, Rick Latham, right behind me. I'm going to move in one second here. You'll see a third Gretsch set. I don't know if you can see the drum kit in the middle, but that's my Peacock Flame drum kit back home. It's been living at my son's house for, I don't know how long, almost a year now. So I got that back a couple of weeks ago and I'm going to do a little work on it, kind of get it back in playing shape. Hey, Gene, howdy neighbor. And uh, so I'm excited to have that drum set back here because God knows I need more drums. Boy, oh boy. But I'm happy to report that um, YouTube wise, I'm up to 680 subscribers as of just before this broadcast. By the way, if you're just tuning in, I apologize for not saying this right from the beginning. This is episode 32, live from my drum room. Today's guest obviously is the great Liberty DeVito. That's why you're all watching. But I just thought I would let you know that. Um, and I do have 680 YouTube subscribers as of today. Pretty exciting. I think I'm actually going to maybe get to 1,000 subscribers. And when that happens, I'm going to cut it off. I'm not going to let anybody else subscribe after that. I'm going to hit that 1K mark, and then I'm going to just cut it. No more subscribers. I don't want anybody subscribing after that. Um, I want to thank everybody for watching Mickey Curry last week. That was a lot of fun. A dear old friend and a lot of fun stories. And we'll definitely do a part two because we realized after we ended the broadcast, we chatted for a while longer and there are a whole bunch of things we didn't get to. So uh, we will do that. Hi, Carmina. Nice to see you. And um, I think you probably saw this coming Friday, the 16th. My next guest will be Ash Sohn, Ashley Sohn. Um, fabulous drummer uh, from the UK, played with Delamitri, Squeeze, tons of um, sessions, you know, a London session drummer and a fabulous drummer and a fabulous guy. So I'm excited to have Ash on the show next Friday, this coming Friday, the 16th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. There's my cousin, Karen. Um, and I want to thank everybody, too, for uh, reaching out and uh, expressing your um, thoughts and well wishes and condolences and all that. And, and I do appreciate that as well. So thanks for that. Um, I think that's really all I have to say. Um, I know Liberty's waiting in the, in the dressing room, in the green room, I should say, munching on some of those delicious cashews I have in there and, and uh, a couple of different kinds of, uh, I love, you know, various mixed nuts. So I always make sure there's plenty in the green room for my guests. So I'm guessing he's enjoying some of those right now. Uh, Jerome, hey, <laughs> please tell Lib I hate him. <laughs> I'll tell him. I'll tell him. Maybe he'll be reading this and he'll see that. He's a very, very, very funny man, boy. And and just before I bring him on, um, we're going to be talking a lot about this today. But this book is so, so great. Life, Billy, and the Pursuit of Happiness. It's it's an autobiography by Liberty DeVito. Um, one of the main reasons why he's on today, but not the only reason, because I mean, he talks about his 30 years with Billy Joel, obviously, in this book, but he's just got an amazing story, life story to tell. And, uh, and uh, you know, it, I, I just think you're going to love this. You're, you're really going to love, you have to get the book, first of all. The book is fabulous, but you're going to love what he has to say, his whole outlook on life and, and everything. Just a real positive, great guy. So, um, highly recommend it. Yeah, I agree, Pat. Amazing human, amazing book. Great, great book. Um, I want to thank Rob Wallace for putting us together. Um, not that it took a lot to put us together, but Rob kind of was the impetus and, and, uh, you know, making all this happen and, and I'm glad it happened the way it did and I'm excited. So I think that's it. Um, Let's see. I was really kind of stalling for time to make sure we had some folks watching, and we do, so that's good. Um, so welcome, everybody. Let me say it again. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining today on this kind of dreary day here in, in the Boston area today. It's a little drab and cold, about 50-something degrees. Yesterday, it was almost 80 and sunny. Spent the day with our grandkids, our two favorite humans on the planet, Fiona and Dylan best day in a really long time. So 
Um, as we wait, any info on the fire at Zildjian this week? Um, no, Mike, you know, I, I think it's, let me just comment because a, a ton of people have, have messaged me or emailed me or asked me about that. Um, I don't think it was a big deal from what I read in the, in the newspaper um, article that someone sent me local newspaper reported that they had it under control in like 40 minutes. And um, I don't think there's any damage or anything. I think in fact, someone Craigie or someone from the company commented that they'd be up and running later that day. So um, everybody don't worry. It would take a lot for Zildjian to not make symbols. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Um, when I worked there, there were at least two or three fires over the course of the 24 years that I worked there, you know, of, of varying degrees. Um, one of which I remember we had to wait quite a long time before we could go back in the building. There were flames up on the, on the roof because of the, the melt room. And I think some residue or debris had gotten into the duct system and it caught on fire and it made its way up to the, to the roof. But that was like 10 years ago. Um, so this one that just happened uh, last week or the week before, I, I don't know, you know, it, I think, you know, we live in, in, in the world of the internet now. So, even the littlest thing can become a really big thing. I could be wrong, but I, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's an issue. Maybe someone from Zildjian will be watching this and can comment and let us know everything's okay. The, the most important thing is no one was hurt that, that much I'm sure. Um, so that's the key. They can always make more symbols, but I'm glad everybody's okay. And I think it's, I think they're back to business, you know, cranking out symbols. So don't worry, everybody. The prices aren't going to go up because you can't get them. <laughs> All will be well. All right. So with that, um, put your hands together. I'm going to ask everybody to put your hands together and, uh, and welcome uh, my very uh, <laughs> my oh, guest, sorry. Liberty sorry, DeVito. Just, just brushing up on some reading. <laughs> what, what part were you reading, Lib? I don't know. It was the book was upside down? I realized after twenty minutes I'm trying to figure out <laughs> anything for a good prop, though. Man, that's <laughs> classic. Oh man, it's it's so good to see you. It's good to be seen, especially during a pandemic. <laughs> oh man, I know. Is it ever? But I, I know you got you got all your shots, right? I You're do. all good to go. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. I saw that on your Instagram. You're you're like ready to get back out and start gigging and. I can't yeah. wait. I can't wait. The March first, uh, May first, the Slim Kings, right? My other band is playing uh, in Connecticut, Fairfield, Connecticut. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, and uh, yeah. So it's an outdoor gig. You know, it, it, it's a car gig. There's no seats. You bring your car. <laughs> yeah, we did one of those last year. Yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> they they beep the horn instead of applauding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's safe. Yeah. Till everybody has their shots, then you can, you know, and, yeah, but, and the weather gets warmer. Yeah. But we're, we're trying. We're trying to get it back, you know, yeah. bring it back. It'll That's come great. back. It'll come back. It'll come it's back. Gotta, and, it's got to rest up. I know. I know. It's It's been unbelievable. What a year to, to uh, yeah, I, I, I know. I know. I, I'm, I, I think the important thing is that all of us just don't get that, that um, you know, uh, not complacency, but we just got to just see it through to the end. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, like we're, we're in the home stretch. Just yeah. everybody get your shot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But yeah. good things have come out of it. I mean, look, you're doing this uh, podcast. You wouldn't have never done it. Had it not yeah. been, we had not, we've been cooped up in our basements. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. No, you're absolutely right. I know. I know it's, it, and it's, it's been fun, you know. It's turned into something fun, and, and I'm I'm so glad you're here today. I've been while you were in the in the green room. I was telling everybody about the book, and um, I, I can't go, I can't say enough about it, Lib. It's it's such a great book. It it uh, I'm a huge fan of your plan, and and I didn't really know you well as a person, but I feel like I from reading the book, I definitely know you better. And it's it's what I always thought the type of person you are. You know, you you just you've got a a, a big heart. And uh, and just so much soul because it comes through in your playing. You know, you can't you can't sound like that on records unless you have all that soul. You know, and right, it's it's passion. It's yeah. I have I have passion for the drums. I have passion for people. 
You know, I love people. I love when they have questions, you know, they want to know what, what how you, how did you do it? You know? And yeah. that's what the book is basically about. It's like how I did it. I didn't go on uh, American Idol and win a contest and then become instantly uh, get a record deal overnight. No, <laughs> neither did Billy, yeah. neither did you, neither did anybody. <laughs> you know, yeah. there's a, there was a lot of, uh, of roads you had to take to get to where you are, you know, and some of them were very dark. And uh, fortunately, I was able to get off those dark roads. Some people didn't. Like you read the chapter on Doug and, um, yeah. you know, he, he just didn't get off that road. So, you know, yeah, I'm sorry about that, too, you know, and, you know, and what and just to jump around a second too, you know, where you mentioned Doug, I, you know, I, I admittedly, I, I never gave a lot of thought. I mean, I always thought you guys were a, a really tight rhythm section, but it's, it's interesting as I read your book and when I go out for my runs in the morning, I've been listening to so much Billy Joel, like every, every morning I listen to like greatest hits one and two or the essentials, you know, downloaded that. Uh, and I really started to zone in on, on not just you, but Doug's bass playing too. And man, what a monster bass player and what an unbelievable rhythm section you guys were. I mean, and you, you know, um, uh, playing bass with Billy, with any piano player is not easy because yeah. Billy's left hand was real busy. So Doug had to find out where to put the bass guitar, you know, yeah. and not, not stumble all over Doug's, uh, Billy's left hand. Right. And he did a right. great job, you know, I mean, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, one of the greatest things that Billy uh, uh, did uh, in his in his career was when he said, I want the same band to do the album with me and go on the road. And then, you know, he had Doug already, uh, who was out on the Street Life Serenade tour with him. <clears throat> and Billy said he wanted to move back to New York. He was living in L.A. at the time. He was in studio catch in the, in the uh, uh, for the sessions in, on the albums yeah. and a different band live. That's what he said to Doug. I want to go back to New York. I want the same uh, band to go on the road with me that records the albums. And I want a New York style drummer. You know, so Doug, I had known Billy when I was 17. He was 18. We played in the same club together. And, yeah. uh, you know, uh, Doug said, you know, the guy. And when we were in the studio recording turnstiles, it was just me, Doug and Billy. And then Billy would listen back and go, I'd like some guitar in here. And we said, oh, we know guitar players because we had a band called Topper. So yeah. Topper became the Billy Joel band right? Uh, with, the, with the inclusion of Richie Cannata. Yep. So we were already tight. We've been playing for years together. So it makes know. sense. I didn't know that till I read the book. Yeah. That makes all the sense in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that explains how you guys, I mean, because it, it right out of the gate, I, and I didn't realize that's not you playing on piano, man, the song piano. No, man. It, no, it, you but, know, you know what? I want to do a thing. Uh, I told Billy Amendola from Modern Drama, <clears throat> I would like to do a, an article. There are so many drummers that are famous for the bands that they've been in that did not play on that first hit single. Yeah, I didn't play on Piano Man. Uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Springsteen's band. Uh, oh, Max. Yeah, Ma Max did not play on Born to Run. Uh, right. Uh, uh, B.J. Wilson did not play on Watershed of Pale with Procol Harrow. Uh, yeah. Ringo did not play on Love Me Do. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, I know, <laughs> okay. I know. Yeah, And it just goes on and on and on. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, yeah, you're, uh, you know, like, I mean, it, it was later in the career, but Charlie didn't play on You Can't Always Get What You Want. It was Jimmy Miller. Right, you know? right. Yeah. And, and uh, it's only rock and roll. It's only uh, rock and roll. Kenny Jones. Yeah. yeah. Great uh, you know, I, I get it. I know. I know. It sounds like Charlie, too. I was. I have to tell you before I, I forget, our, our old friend Jerome Marcus has a message for you way back at the beginning. He said, <laughs> tell Liberty I hate you. He'll know what that means. <laughs> I do know what that means. That, that's a term of endearment for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's his wife's birthday today. Oh, happy yeah. birthday to your wife, Jerome. Yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that's awesome. Um. You know, and just just we won't dwell on this song, Piano Man. I was going to I was going to sort of make a joke and say that it, that whoever it was. <laughs> no, I, I, was gonna, well, I know you played with Billy Joel for 30 years and I was sort of going to make a joke about Piano Man. No, no, no. I was just going to say that wh whoever it was must have heard you play because I think they played it just like you. <laughs> no, no, no. You know who played it? It was Ron Tutt, Elvis's drummer. Oh, Ronnie Tutt. Well, that explains it. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's, yeah. he played great on those two albums, you know? Yeah. 
I didn't I realize just, it was Ronnie Tut. Yeah. I just think that that Billy stepping away from the studio cats and having yeah. guys that played live all the time, you know, really made the difference. Put the put the energy behind it, you know. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And and I you know, it's somebody like yourself too, 30 years with Billy. All those hit songs. I mean, so many hits. A ton. I just a, a ton of hits. And and it's I think someone like yourself, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, you, you, when you were playing with Billy, you didn't consider yourself a session guy necessarily, right? You were, you were no. the drummer in the Billy Joel band. But I think what, what happens is you really turned into like a session guy from the standpoint of like, probably without even knowing it, being able to go in the studio and quickly get your part down. Yeah. Like your drums probably, I'm, I'm guessing I wasn't there, but you probably had your drums sounding great engineers didn't have to screw around with them and it's like you you because you know i've i've talked to charlie watts who of course is not a, a session guy but all those records it turns you into that same sort of head of like how you go in and you're you're efficient and you're you're um you know you you get the most of the time that you're there right it, you know that one of the first sessions i did outside of billy it was uh when we did uh we were doing um 52nd street right after the stranger right uh phoebe snow wanted me to play on her record and i said how do you want me to play she just said i want you to be the liberty that's on the song my life i just want you to be play, wow. be liberty that's what yeah. i want you know and that that's what people want is they want me to be liberty and yeah. you can see it's obvious when i'm trying to be someone else i had a hard time doing get it right the first time on the um, uh, Stranger album, because I, we were in the studio for the first time with Phil Ramone, and Phil used to use all those guys, Gad, you know, Richard T, all those guys. And yeah. some of them did play on the Stranger with us. Richard T played on the Stranger, uh, Hiram Bolock, uh, uh, Hugh McCracken, you mm -hmm. know, those guys played with us on the Stranger. Now, get it right the first time, I was trying to be Steve Gadd. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we couldn't get it. I just could not get it, you know. And, and every time we tried it, we, we, we would do a song, then try to get it right the first time. Wasn't happening. Do another song, try to get it right the first time. It wasn't happening. I told Phil, I said, why don't you just get Steve Gadd to play it? He goes, no, you're going to get it. And it wasn't until I realized that I have to be Liberty DeVito to play it, you know. Yeah. Yep. And, that, and, and, you know, and that's what happened. Some, somebody wrote a review once that said it sounded like it sounded I sound like Steve Gadd on 100 cups of coffee or something like that. <laughs> uh, no, I, I love that part of the book where you talk about that, because I, I could totally see that, too. You were you were going, OK, I got to I've got to sound like this. And and it just it it maybe it took Phil to tell you that. But it, in reality, it had to be you being you to to, you know, have it feel right and be right and all that. And yeah. Well, yeah, you know, yeah. as, you, as you're growing up and you're, you're learning and you're listening to other drummers, you try to emulate them first before you, you know, move yeah. on uh, with your own thing. And even even as far as uh, purchasing your drums, I mean, everybody went out and bought Ludwig's when Ringo was on the Ed Sullivan show. Yeah. Everybody wanted that oyster kit, you know. Uh, and then when Dino Donnelly came out, I had to get a 24 inch bass drum. You know, Ludwig, mine was Burgundy Sparkle because I saw him with a Burgundy Sparkle kit. You That's know? so cool. And the same thing happened when I was in the studio um, with Billy. When I auditioned for Billy, I um, he asked me, he said, what do you want? What do you need? I said, how about a new set of drums? Because I was yeah. using piece together things. And uh, I, I had seen Steve Gadd with uh, the uh, Pearl uh, fiberglass Tom Toms, the, you know, the uh, yeah. 8, 10, 12. And I said, yeah, I, I'd like those. <laughs> We went for, so it was the same thing, you know. There I was playing, you know, that Gad sound, you know, yeah, which is a great set of drums. So that's that's what we do as drummers, you know. Uh, yeah, yep. you walk in and you want to sound like this, you want to sound like that, you know. So I just love playing drums. <laughs> that's so cool, Liv. I, you know, you mentioned that in the in the book. You talk about how you went into, um, I forget the shop in on on Forty Eighth Street in New York, and you and you got the drum set. Frank's was it? it was called Frank's. yeah Frank's yeah. yeah of course and and uh and the and the, the pearl concert toms fiberglass concert toms I didn't realize it was it was because you'd seen Steve using them that but I know he yeah. was using them at that time so and and that that was a question I was going to ask you and that 
So up until you got with Tama around 78, I think you said in the book, does that sound right? Yeah, it's, it, it was uh, uh, during the um, 52nd Street album. Yeah. 50, okay. And so, so all those records before that were the Pearl fiberglass drums. Turnstiles and the Stranger, the Pearl fiberglass drums. Those, yeah. Yeah. Okay. What those, a sound, those, man. What, you know, yeah. no, no bottom heads. And yeah. not, unlike when you took the bottom head off your, your toms, uh, like they did in the disco uh, yeah. craze, yeah, they were flat. The, these had tone to them too, but still with no, no bottom head on it. I wish yeah, I still had yeah. that kit. I, I had given them to a lawyer friend of me that got me out of a bunch of traffic tickets. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe he'll give them back to you. Maybe, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it'll it'll find its way back to you. Yeah, I, I think it was probably that fiberglass shell that you're talking about that had that yeah. gave it that resonance that that, like, and, that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, and even the bass drum was that thin fiberglass too. You know? Yeah, yeah, but the stands were were bad. I mean, they couldn't hold up to the road. And that's when I, uh, somebody had told me about this company, Tama, which used to be a low-end drum set. Now, all of a sudden, they're this fantastic drum company, and they have knurled cymbal uh, holders. Yeah. You know, yep. they were the first ones with the knurled cymbal holders. And that was the ticket for me. Once I got the knurled, it wouldn't move anymore. Yeah, so. yeah. I know the hardware was, like, revolutionary when it came out. Yeah. It really was, yeah. And and I, I was working in a drum shop from 79 until the mid 80s. And I remember seeing pictures of you in the Tama catalog with the Imperial Star kit, the like pewter finish, whatever. I yeah. think that's what it was called. Yeah. And and it's it's interesting because you bought those drums because you wanted to sound like Steve. People were buying those drums to sound like you, you know, when they when you started playing those drums on on records, it was like that was the sound, you know. You know, Tama, so, the hardware, we're talking about the hardware of Tama. It, it was so good back then and, and so cutting edge and new that I, I endorse Liberty Drums now, a little company, boutique company out of England. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and they don't make hardware. So I, I use Tama hardware with the Liberty Drums. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Kind of kind of back to. Yeah, that's good. It's, it's good stuff. Yeah. So I was going to ask you, Liv, how long did it take to write the book? I, I just I jotted a few things down. I didn't want to forget to ask you. How well, the, I started to write the book as a, as a uh, family history uh, for my kids. You know, I have four daughters and, uh, and I wanted them to know where we came from. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and that, you know, I, I was my father lived till he was 91. My mother was uh, 89 when she passed away. So I was able to uh, tape them, you know, record them and the stories that they had. And um, so one, then once I uh, ended with Billy, I thought, let me write about, you know, my time with Billy. Sure. Yeah. But what happened was the more you, you're first angry about what happens when you have a falling out with somebody. And, and of course, the band, you know, we parted ways and mm -hmm. I didn't talk to Billy. We didn't talk to each other for 15 years. And uh, you're, you're angry about it. You're bitter about it. And in, in interviews. I would be saying things about him and he'd be saying things about me, you know. Uh, but when I said like, oh, he's a he's a whatever, I, I felt bad for saying it because when you break up with a girlfriend or something like that, you you really still love the person, but you badmouth them because you're so angry. Yeah. You know, yeah, and inside yeah. you feel sick, like, oh, why did I say that? I still really like this person, but it got me so angry, you know. So I I didn't want to throw anybody under the bus. I wasn't going to do one of those books. And um, uh, so I thought I would look at, uh, from Billy's, standing in Billy's shoes. Let's see what, what Billy was thinking. Why did he do the things he did? I mean, the man had a massive career. Mm. So how many years? Like over 50 years now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's certain things you have to do to stay on top in this business and sometimes it's like okay i gotta change my style i have to get new players i have to you know i have to get a different look i have to you know you can't yeah. stay the same that's why at the end of the book i put those three things you know what managers love you know yeah. the single yeah. artist or the eagles which is a band or you know yeah so um, yeah. yeah so i started to write about that and then i thought let me start like when i first started playing drums because there's so many guys out there giving lessons on, on the, on the internet. Uh, this is how you do it. Uh, and when I was in sixth grade, 
and I couldn't do the buzz roll yeah. uh, on the Star Spangled Banner. The teacher said, put the sticks down, DeVito. You'll never do anything with this. You know, it's funny. I got to tell you this. Uh, when I was in sixth grade, uh, my friend Tom Lipton, Lipton uh, took the same lessons in the sixth grade school band. But there was only one snare drum in the school band. So he had to bring his to, to the school. And, and I used to play his. But he recently moved to Florida. And before he moved, he said, I got this old drum. You played it. Do you want it? And I said, sure, I'll take it. And this is it right here, Slingerland. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Beautiful. It's, it looks, it looks e brand new. It even has the original head. Wow. Look at it. that. Yeah. I know you love drums and you love old drums and stuff. I do. Yeah. You know, that's a, yeah, that's beautiful, man. What, and what a nice gift. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. I mean, he came to a Lord's gig and he had this drum and it was like, are you going to play it tonight? I said, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> and he obviously didn't play. He probably didn't play past the sixth grade, right? He just kind of. No. Yeah. yeah. And he gave me some hardware, like a, a hi-hat that came at the time of, of that, you know. Yeah. Hi-hat stand, cymbals. <laughs> yeah. But that's, and that, that's a great, that's a great lesson that you, in the book where you talk about, you know, I, I made a note of that too, because it, it you know, playing fast and, and, and you, you talk about all, you know, like how people are set at kind of different gears and how they play, yeah. you know, how sick, like, and you mentioned yourself and you mentioned Steve. Um, and I'll just quickly, I don't, this is, this is about you, Liv. It's not about me, but I want to just tell you a quick, funny story about Steve. He, I, I had stopped playing for like 20 years. And that during the time that I was working in the, in the business side of it. And when I left Zildjian, I really wanted to start playing again. And some buddies, like we were talking earlier, my, my old bandmates from like, from 14 years old contacted me about playing with them again. And, and I sucked. I just, I really needed to just like get back and start playing again. So Steve was kind of like my coach, you know, every day he'd call me and, and say, how'd you do today? What'd you work on? And I, and, and after a couple of weeks, you know, I could feel some stuff coming back and I said, um, yeah, you know, Steve, I, I just, I don't know, man, I, I'm, I'm hitting a, a, a like a, a block or something. I said, I, you know, I'm, He's like, well, like what, you know, Steve, he's like, well, what's the problem? What, what's, what, what's going on? I said, well, like, I can't really play anything fast. And he lost it, man. He went like fast. What the fuck do you want to play fast for? Let me tell you something right now. Nobody gives a shit about how fast you play. <laughs> he, just, he went <laughs> off for like five minutes. He's like, listen, work on your time, work on your feel, get comfortable, play everything slow. And just, he said, you know, play some rudiments, but play them slow to get your hands yeah. loose and comfortable. Yeah. Just like what you're talking about. And he said, don't, don't get hung up on that bullshit, man. Don't any, I'm like, okay. <laughs> but it was a great lesson. It was a really great lesson. And it's, I took it, took it to heart. You got to, you got to when he said yeah. something, you know, that, yeah, that's, that's, you know, Dom Femularo is the global ambassador to drums. Yes. Steve Gadd is God. To drum God, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, I, I remember, you know, Steve had, we all have that, that same like a uh, little blip uh, in your drumming career. And I remember when Steve, uh, um, you know, straightened himself out and, um, yeah. you know, I think he was, he was just, uh, just getting back to playing again. And, um, we were at the uh, the collective in LA, I think it was, and we were, were backstage before he did his drum clinic, and mm -hmm. he was really really nervous about it. And uh, I said, "What are you What are you nervous about?" It? He's like, "I don't know, man. I haven't done this in a, in a while." I yeah. said, "I said, but but you you play so great." And then he said to me, he "Goes, yeah, but everybody can play like that now." I said, "But nobody plays it like Steve Gadd." You know, there's so many guys like, oh, I could play 50 Ways to Live, you love Oh, I could play, you know, late yeah. in the evening. Oh, I could. No, no, you can't. It's like these guys that play this the, the Purdy Shuffle. Yeah, I can play the Purdy Shuffle. No, you can't. Did you ever see Bernard Purdy play it? Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, you can't play it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I would, well, personally speaking, I would say that you could say the same thing about just the way you are. Uh. Um I, my, I just have to take a quick funny story. When that song was popular, I graduated high school in 78 when that song was, you know, at the top of the charts. And my band got hired to play, I think, two different proms that year. And of course, that was the theme song. And I apologize now, Liberty, for, for 
butchering that song because when I listen to it now, I realize there's there's so much really going on with that song. It's 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 not a simple song, and it's not just. I was just sort of getting as close to the accents as I could, but but that's one of those songs that's tricky. Well, there was a lot of uh, creative stuff going on in, in in that song. That's why we were fortunate that that the Grammy that it won was for Record of the Year which is song of the year is for the artists or the guys that wrote it record yeah. of the year is for all those people that were involved in putting that song together. And I can remember creating that drum beat with Phil Ramon, you know, and, yeah. and Phil, Phil came up with that little flip beat in the, uh, you know, I could see him through the control room. I still can see him today, you know, just going oh. like, like this, you know, like, <laughs> this is it. This is it. You're, you're there. You're this close. <laughs> <laughs> he must have been so great to work with. He he because he hey Rob Wallace says hi by the way. He, Rob's Rob's watching. Um, Rob who? Rob who? <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know Phil, I, I I remember seeing a clip that Rob did. In fact, we interviewed Phil talking about Steve doing Fifty Ways and yeah. and how he sort of nurtured that whole thing along when Steve was just kind of fooling around in between takes. A little military marching thing and he's like sure. keep, keep doing that yeah and and he he must have been such a great champion of drummers it sounds like in your book where he was just such a great guy to have there yeah he loved rhythm i mean when we did moving out uh was the first song that we recorded with phil for the stranger and billy originally wanted it to go phil walked up to the drums that stood right in front of the drums and went no boom that's what people want to hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's funny, a, you, you mentioned yeah. 50 Ways to Leave Your Lovers with Steve. I remember sitting with him and um, we were, uh, somebody had asked me a question about, um, uh, you know, do, do you guys get uh, royalties for, the, you know, you, you created that part for just the way you are. And it, it really makes the song. And I said, what do you think, Steve? And he looked at me and he said, <laughs> don't get me started. <laughs> Oh, oh man, I know, I know. I've I've heard that too. Live uh, and people have said to me like, "Boy, he must be he must he must be sitting pretty man with those fifty ways royalties." I'm like, oh, you know, if only, it's like, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. And 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 forgive me for not remembering the, the tune that you reference in the book where where Phil wanted you to play sort of like a disco beat, and you were like, my "No life. way, I'm." My oh, it was my life. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no way. I'm not playing a straight point of bass drum. There's no yeah. way. Yeah. Slam that thing down on the table and said, you've been in this business for what, 20 minutes now? And you're going to tell me what you're not going to play? Yeah. That, gold, that gold single is on the wall. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's Yeah. The man knew his stuff for sure. Yeah. He really did. He really did. He used to take Billy songs and, and you know, Billy would have ideas. Billy... When we first start an album, Billy would come in, maybe one or two songs would be complete. Uh, like the Innocent Man album, he had Tell Her About It and Tell Her About It. Easy, yeah. easy Money, I think he had, because he had written it for the movie. For, you know, So he has a lot of bits and pieces, little ideas. And he runs them past the band. And if they fly, he'll go home and finish the song. Yeah, yeah. Some of the bits and pieces... Like I remember Uptown Girl and, and a couple other tunes where Billy would have the song. He'd go, how's this? And he played the song and Phil would say, no, take this part and make this part that you're calling the verse, the chorus, and then make the chorus, the verse. You know, he would do that to Billy's songs. Wow. You know? Yeah. 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 That's and, and a great producer and and the ability to step back from it, maybe that Billy couldn't do as the writer. And then Phil could just kind of go, no, I'm hearing this. Yeah. This flip it around and make the verse, the chorus, the chorus, the verse, whatever. And yeah. Right. Speaking. Right. I was going to say, speaking of innocent man, the song innocent man, it, it made me rediscover his, his vocal performance on that song is like, I, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like he probably doesn't get the credit that he deserves as a singer. You know, I I think he's he's a fabulous singer. I mean, he's such a great songwriter and piano player, and and but I think you know he's his vocals in that song in particular are just they they really move me. It's amazing. You know, it's funny because 
you know, we have the band, the Lords of 52nd Street now. It's myself, Richie Canada, and Russell Javis from the original Billy Joel band. It, yeah. uh, and um, it's, we get a guy to do the Billy part. And people will say, um, wow, he sounds just like Billy. And I look at them and go, no, I played with the real guy. You know, he's good, <laughs> but he doesn't sound just like Billy. You know? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, Billy laid it all out there. When we played live, he laid it all out there. When we, I remember being in the studio and 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 doing the song "Honesty," and at the end, he sings a, a, a note that's so high. He just looked at all and said, I'll, "I'll never hit that note again." <laughs> you know, it's like yeah, he gave it his all. You know, yeah, it's just great like that. Yeah, really. I mean, it's it's and 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 you mentioned this earlier too, where you, you, it started off as a and it makes sense now that, that it started off as really sort of chronicling your your family and your your. Um, your parents coming over and, or your, your, I guess your grandparents coming grandparents, over from Italy. Yeah. Grandparents. Yeah. Mine, mine too. And, and then your parents meeting and, um, and then it evolving into the story about you and Billy. Um, and that's what I love about the book is it, it's, it, it's not just the way some of, of other people write books. It's not just about the band that you were in for 30 years. It's a great right. story about you and, and like playing with Mitch Ryder and, and and meeting Dino Danelli the first time at a gig when you were 14, I think you said, or yeah, yeah, and and when, he, you know he was like nice to you and and yeah, that's when so you cool. When you mentioned before that the the, the, the way I play and then uh, the person that I became, the person that I am when I meet fans is because of Dino and because of the Rascals. You know, they yeah. when I walked in that room, they could see that I was in awe of them and they were so kind you know yeah. i don't know if they laughed when i left but you know. no i'll bet they didn't man i bet you no. know they 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 dug it i'm sure they did and you know i was afraid when i was reading the story i was afraid where where you had to go back and and uh and get a uh, was it an amp or was it a guitar i i a guitar bass guitar. guitar bass guitar sorry yeah you went and i'm thinking oh man i hope this guy doesn't jive them and not let them meet you know yeah. but the, the fact that you got to meet um you know the rascals and 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 that like just had to cement it for you right there that that like i'm gonna do this no matter what this yeah is it. and then and then uh you know to ask them would you dedicate mustang sally to me because <laughs> right. i knew right. i knew my girlfriend regina was in the audience and she went <laughs> to the bathroom when she didn't hear her. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we she know hates, they did. She hates that I put that in the book. The only part you put them on me is I put it in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. There was there was a lot of really funny stuff in there. A lot of, I mean, up and down. I was, I was, uh, you know, you, there was some really heavy stuff, and and yeah. and uh, and and you, you know, you did a fabulous job of just taking everybody through the whole roller coaster of of life you know emotions and everything yeah really well good. well that's what life is like you, you know yeah you, you, you've gone from job to job to band to band you know it, it's not like if you wrote a book you wouldn't write about just, just these webcam things that you're doing you <laughs> no know? i wouldn't <laughs> how did you get there how did you get to sit right there right now and how did i get to sit right here right now you know yeah. i mean if i didn't go through all that and, and learn how to play by listening to all the guys that I played with, you know, I would have maybe not been able to play with Billy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's all that, all that stuff. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, and, and it's, you're, you, I, I agree completely. It was like a path that you followed and it was, you're right. I mean, if you hadn't gone on the road with Mitch Ryder, maybe you wouldn't have, you, you wouldn't have been prepared when the time came. You well, know. you know, you know, it's great about the chapter is when he's sitting on the bus and he sits next to me and yeah. he says, oh, that's and he says that thing. Yeah, I don't want to give it away. Somebody buys the book. But, yeah. you know, it was like after Dino and them. And then he says this to me. It's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you yeah. kidding? <laughs> I know. Yeah. No, it's I'm going to just read a couple of things that people are, are uh, I think, want to ask you or just comment. Um, okay. Eddie D. Frazzini. Hey, Lib, right, you should tell the story. Yeah, about when you were going to rehearse with the Lords and listening to the radio, and a particular song came on. Oh, geez. Eddie, 
I said, listen, and I was like, Eddie's my muse. You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> he's always there for me, Eddie, if I need him, you know. Uh, but we, he, we, we were being inducted into the Long Island Music Hall of Fame, the, the Lords of 52nd Street. Now, I didn't want to go because I was still upset about the whole thing. I wasn't listening to the music or anything like that. Like, ah. So Eddie's riding with me out there. And uh, I said, wow, I probably should have listened to the songs. I knew we were going to do scenes from a tiny restaurant. I said, I probably should have listened to the songs. Ah, you know what? Q plays it all the time. Q 104.3, you know, in New York. They play it all the time. I'll just put the radio on. Bam, it came right on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're playing all the time. It was like, oh my god, uh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. Oh man, yeah. That happened to me once before. I, I went down to see uh, 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 what band with it was Brad uh, Brett Michaels. Uh, he was in uh, oh Poison. Poison, yeah. I went to see Poison. Brett Michaels had invited us down, and he asked me if I would sit in with the band, which at the end didn't. It didn't happen. It didn't work out. There wasn't time to do it. But he says, we're going to play uh, I Want to Rock and Roll All Night by Kiss. And you can sit in and play with us. And I'm like, oh, I'm not sure if I know that song. And my wife says, turn on the radio. Maybe it's on. Boom. It was on. <laughs> oh, you might be able to. I don't know. That that could be something you could make money on, Lib, maybe, you know, like. Go to Stumped Vegas to and have a radio. Go to Vegas and have a radio. What song you want to yeah. hear? Just bam. <laughs> Boom. Hey, our, uh, Chad Cromwell says, hey, guys, I've been a fan, Liberty fan for decades. I don't know if you know Chad. He's a, he's an old buddy of mine. Plays with Neil Young. and Yeah, Chad. Uh, yeah. I was just reading about him. Oh, you know why I know? Because I was looking at your, your uh, stuff. I was just reading about him. Yeah. 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 Really. He's played with everybody. He actually played with Dire Straits and... A million, a million people. Yeah. Right. Hi, Chad. I'm going to be talking to you soon, buddy. Los Carlos says hi, Los. Oh, uh, Los. We love Los. I'm just, I, I, I always, this happens, Lib. I, I, when we finish these things, I see a bunch of questions I missed and wish that I'd asked. Dave Wasikinen says he's a very humble dude. Nobody can be Liberty DeVito. Uh, Dave's my brother. Dave's yeah. my brother. He's, he's a great, great guy. And uh, another friend of yours and mine, Joe Milliken, who wrote that great book about Ben Orr, Let's yeah. Go. Um, yeah. And I remember there was a, a nice, he wrote a nice piece about you in there with your, the time you played with Ben. Um, and he just said, uh, I was honored to have you participate in my book, Let's Go, Benjamin Orr and the Cars, provide some insights about your time with Ben and big people. Yeah, that was, that was a really touching section of the book, too. Yeah, last well. Ben was uh, Ben was our rock star. You know, it was myself, Jeff Carlisi from 38 Special, Derek St. Holmes from Ted Nugent Band, yeah. uh, Pat Travers, and Ben and myself. And uh, Ben was our rock star. I mean, he would walk up to the mic and sing Drive, and the girls would, like, faint. <laughs> I think I'd faint if I... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. I, I know. He, he was... He was Really, spe- I I got to meet him a few times um, working in Boston and and uh, sweetheart of a guy and yeah. what a talent, yeah. Regular guy, just regular guy. Yeah. Regular guy, like you, like you. Um, yeah, I, I just a couple other things I I uh, was going to mention that I I don't want to forget to mention to you. Talking about song drumming and uh, and you talk a lot about that in the in the book and just you know that's that's really where you come from and yeah. uh, I, you know I just want to I just want to reiterate that 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 I personally would put you right alongside our hero Ringo and and all the great song drummers um, Jim Gordon who you talk about in the book Steve Gadd uh, Jeff Beccaro another great you know somebody yeah. who plays for the song. Um, I just, you know, it's, it's such a yeah great lesson for drummers. You know, it's, it's, it's funny because, um, uh, I remember when I, when I was uh, with Tama and uh, I, the first, uh, clinic drum clinic I ever did was for the Long Island drum center. Uh, I wasn't familiar with this stuff. You know, I mean, I, I say something in the book about when yeah. going to see the old ones and stuff like, you know, the ones before and stuff like that. But anyway, I did one and I, I, 
didn't know what kind of drummer I was. You know, I just went to play and I, I it sucked. It really did. It really sucked. And I, I remember telling Joe Hibbs, rest his soul, um, and Dom Famularo, I said, I, I'll never do that again. I will never, ever do a clinic again. And I remember uh, Dom came over my house and he sat down with me and he said, okay, uh, just play something for me. And I played in my basement solo. I love to do a solo with, with the, the uh, multi rods. Yeah. I love that sound on the drums. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I do that in hired gun. I do a, a solo in hired gun. Only solo I've ever done. That one and the one that I did play for Dom. It's the only times I've ever done a solo. <laughs> then Don said, can you get any of your Billy Joel songs and take the drums off them and you can play to them? Because you play for the song. You're a songwriter's drummer. You don't do those big solos like other guys do. Fort I was fortunate enough to ask Billy. And he said, yeah, go ahead. And, and somebody went to the vault where, where wow. these 48 track tape recordings were. And I remember sitting with the engineer and, and, you know, some of them were stuck together. They barely moved. And, you know, wow. and I got like 11 songs and, and I was doing that. And, you know, you don't, you don't know who you are or what you do. You know, you, you, you don't get the praise from your other band members. They don't turn back to you at the end of the night and go, wow, you're the greatest drummer we ever played with. Wow. You No, it's like, you're, you're back there because you're expected to be that way. You know? Yeah. So yeah. Billy never tells you. You only I remember somebody asked me, they said, does Billy uh, tell you when you play great? And I said, no, he only lets me know when I did something wrong, you know, because they'll be like, oh, that sucked. Try something else. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you but know? I, yeah. Yeah. So when I when I sat there with Dom and then and then I had these songs to play to, it was like this. Yeah, this is who I am. I, I'm a songwriter's drummer. And that came back from learning uh, by myself. No lessons. Because back when Ringo came out, nobody wanted to teach me how to play rock and roll or play like Ringo. You yeah, know, so, yeah. So I had to listen to the music. Records became my books. They were my books, you know? <laughs> and yeah, no, and, and I think there's something to be said for that too, because it, it I think <clears throat> lessons are certainly a good thing, but I think you prove that you don't always have to have lessons to, to, to be successful because you went a different way. Uh, I had Jerry Murata on a couple of weeks ago or a week or so yeah. ago. And he was, and he was, no, actually, sorry, let me back up Andy Newmark and uh -huh. Andy was, yeah. And Andy was talking about how he, you know, Andy was trained as a young drummer. He took lessons and he learned the rudiments. And he said, when Rick Murata learned to play, he just went straight for like, I'm going to play a basic beat. I'm going to learn how to, you know, sit down behind the drums and, play from start to finish and play for a song and, and it, you know, a different approach that, that right. people take and yeah, and it works. Uh, but, but I was just going to say, but I, I think in a way it almost like allows you to have almost like a clearer head when it comes to how you approach a song too. If you're, if you're not trying to play something technical because you know how to play it, you're just, you're right. just feeling it. You're just going, yeah, it's got to kind of move also, to the ride. Yeah. It also, um, trying to pick things off a record, sometimes you, you don't hear it exactly the way the guy's playing it because he might be doing something with his left hand that you're thinking he's doing it with his right hand and stuff like yeah. that. Like, I can't do the Purdy Shuffle. I just can't do it. You know, I never had uh, a reason to have to do it. I never, you know. Um, but when I heard it, I thought it went a certain way. And I came up with something else that you it's similar to it, but it's not like it. You know, it's nothing like it. It's more of a, a rock version of it, you know, uh, yeah. where where I can bounce around the drums more. And uh, so I was able to do that with a lot of stuff like uh, not not knowing how they did it. Uh, my interpretation and it became uh, my thing then. Yeah, because, you know, I wasn't doing it the way they did it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No. And, and I was going to say it, it's it's it became your thing and, and your thing became its own thing, too. You know what I mean? It's right. like how you yeah, how you approach it and how you approach the songs. And there, there's so many songs that, that I, 
listened to over the last couple of weeks is, you know, as I kind of went through the catalog again. And, and I, I, I said this earlier too, like the song drumming element part of it is like, I, to me, that's the, that's the hardest part of being a good drummer is coming up with the parts, you know, and yeah. I know you certainly know that. And I think, I think I don't want to, I don't want to insult any drummers out there, but I wish more, <laughs> I wish more drummers knew that, you know, I think so many people get hung up on, on playing fast or technical and don't yeah. realize the genius behind crafting a part, like whether it's just like all those songs we were talking about, not just, just the way you are, but I mean, like, you know, you've, you've come up with these really memorable parts that work so perfectly for those songs. Yeah. Well, you know, it's like, uh, again, Dom Famularo, you know, I, I we talk so much because we do the sessions together, yeah. you know, that, yeah. that whole thing. And, um, uh, he, he, we were talking about, I was looking at a music book once, you know, like, uh, drumming, uh, the notes and everything there. And I was like, and, he, and I got to the last page and I turned that last page and he looked at the page and he goes, you know, though, why this is blank. Uh, I said, no, why is it blank? And he said, because this is when you have to start to create your own stuff. This is it right here. You don't always go back and reference that book. Now it's time to create, yeah. you know, and, yeah. he's, and he's right. I mean, uh, you know, being creative, there's so many different things you can do in, in drumming. You know, uh, like I, I couldn't do jingles because I can't read. They want that instant boom. Do the jingles yeah. read. A lot of people uh, I know the country guys, uh, um, Rich Redman. You know, he goes in there and they write out their country charts because they wanted exactly like the record. I'd be like, yeah. ah, you know, <laughs> I, I could think of something better. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, so and. There's so many drummers that that didn't take lessons, and you know it's funny because Buddy Rich didn't take lessons. I know, yeah, you know, but I, I think lessons are important. You know, yeah, learn learn the rudiments and stuff like that. Now, I play rudiments, but I don't know that I'm playing them. You know, because it's in the drumming. Who knew? I didn't know I was playing triplets and you know, right. flams and paradiddles sometimes. You know, right? But you just do it. You, know. you just because I was going to say you, you can hear you can hear that stuff in what you play, but obviously you're you're playing because you, you, you're you're feeling it, you're hearing it. You you know, it works in a certain place of the song, but you, you didn't right. go into it going, I'm going to play a triplet, you know. Right. I remember telling Billy once I said, you know, uh, we were, I think we were playing and, and we were up in Boston and I said, you know what? I th I'm thinking about going. Berkeley, I'm gonna I'm gonna learn how to how to read and write music. And he said, stop. He said, please don't, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, I I know I know what he was trying to say. Yeah, it's like don't change anything. Right. Yeah. Don't go yeah. change it. I was gonna say that. <laughs> you were ready to sing it, weren't you? <laughs> I was. <laughs> Uh, I got a shout out to my guitar player, uh, Paul Gianelli, who's a huge fan of yours and Billy. And he just said, Allentown is a killer feel. Likes that one, huh? He likes that one. You know, it, it, I remember when after Doug passed, we had a bunch of different bass players that played with us. You know, uh, T-Bone Walk, a great T-Bone Walk. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. David Santos, uh, uh, the uh, guy that plays with him now, uh, what's his name? Uh, I can't remember his name. Anyway. There was always a point in Allentown where it goes, dun, 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 and does this whole thing. And then there's yeah. a turnaround that if they got lost there, they had to stop playing until it went to dun, 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 dun again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know that part you're talking about too. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's probably something that you just felt, right? I mean, you just, yeah, yeah you never even thought about it. It's just, yeah. No, yeah. never thought about it. A couple of times, like the beginning of, uh, 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 what, what is it? Oh, Laura, when it goes, do, 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 I had to ask him, I said, Billy, you have to count for me before you start it. I don't know where one is. Yeah. <laughs> that's great stuff to, you know, that, that's, that's the kind of shit you want to hear about too. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. 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 Or oh, get it right the first time. I think I mentioned it in the book where I'm, it fades in because yes. I had a 
practice it before I actually, oh, okay, now I feel comfortable. Uh, then we, <laughs> it's all the behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. Especially and, when you learn stuff right away, you're learning it right away, right, right there. And then, yeah. you know, I think, uh, um, uh, until the night on the on the 52nd Street album, it's like, I, I think I may have heard the song like twice. And, and it's right. like, okay, roll the tape, let's go. It's like, when I was done with it, I was like, I can't believe I made it through this song. <laughs> so when that happens, so in a song like that, did you have to then, because I can't imagine if you, if you did it, you just learned it on the spot, you did it in one more or maybe two takes, you probably had to learn it, right? You didn't really remember it. Like if, if Billy said, we're going to play this tomorrow night at his show. I'm guessing you'd go, oh man, I need to listen to this a bunch of times to, to remember what I played. Or could you, did you have it right there in your, no. <laughs> take to take. You'd hear the, the, the call, the, the uh, talk back button from Phil. You know what you play in the second verse? Play that again. What did I play? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Play it for me, Phil. Yeah. 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 yeah play it. Can you play it? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, but that's, that's, that's honest. You know, that's real. Cause I can't imagine if you're, yeah, if you're, you're rolling tape and then they go, that's it. That's, that's done. You're like, Oh, wait a minute. What? It just went yeah. by like that. And yeah. Yeah. And, and cool to read too, that you didn't, you did. I wondered this too, that I assumed you used a click on a lot of the tunes. I just, it, it, the, the time is, is so great. Really. I mean, you have great oh. natural time and, and it's, it's so cool to, to know that it was, it wasn't done with click tracks all the time. No, the click, we used the click. Phil would put the click on. When we finally, when you, you know, when you settle into, this is the best tempo for this song. When you find that, Phil would set a click and we would start to play with it. If the song got a little faster as it got, went on, that was okay. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think uh, sometimes a fantasy, if you started it from the beginning and then just dropped the needle on the end, it's, it's so much faster than the beginning of the song. But, Sometimes it wasn't the take. Somebody would make a mistake. And usually when you, where you end your tempo is when you start the next song, it picks up to that tempo. Yeah, so Phil would yeah. always have that click to go take us back to that original tempo again. Yeah. You know? yep. And I remember like panicking when he first, like the click was present because it was in the Neve board. There was a click in there, you know? And Steve Kahn telling me, don't worry, the click is your friend. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Steve. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I, and I was going to ask you that question, like to, to go from, you know, how you, how you started as a drummer and, and evolved to that point where they're introducing this still kind of a new thing at that time, probably the click track. Yeah. Probably made you a little uncomfortable and, and at first, but, but well, the way know, it was you, used. You listen to the drummers that you listen, that you grew up listening to. I mean, if, if I listen to Beatles songs, I can hear when Ringo's speeding up and slowing down. You can hear yeah. that. You can hear the sure. Rascals. The Rascals were so free at what they were doing. Yeah. You know, it's like they're always on the edge of like, you know, hold it back. This is yep. Ray Temple. Hold, hold it back. And Dino's like, I want to go. I, you know, I want to <laughs> go for it. You know? Yeah. And then you yeah. got to the, to the point with the fudge with Combine where the tempos changed so much in the song, you know, that you had to get that in your head but it wasn't yeah. until i really got into r&b like aretha franklin sam and dave all that kind of stuff i was listening to and roger hawkins was a drummer on a lot of the stuff i was listening to and his tempo was like pfft, yeah right there but you could still hear when the chorus comes it goes a little bit faster and then mm -hmm. it slows down again you know but he was so great and he's another one no lessons didn't think he was any good you know, <laughs> I didn't know Roger Hawkins. I thought he read music. He doesn't read music. I don't think so. No, I don't wow. think so. That's amazing. You know? Yeah. I mean, Christine, Christine, if you're on listening, would you uh, tell me if Roger Hawkins, <laughs> if you listen? she would know? Yeah. I, yeah. I, you know, I, you just assume a guy that worked at Muscle Shoals that he, you know, they gave him charts and stuff. But I, I wouldn't be surprised because he's he's such a you know, a monster player. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so great oh man this feel was great yeah i know but you know but, but then we you talk about a guy like hal our great hal blaine who cool. had that great you know and steve too the great blend of like you know could read a chart but could make it feel like new instinctively the right thing to play great feel 
um, you know, these, these guys that, that kind of had the whole package all, all together, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, 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 all you have to say is uh, Asia, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy. I mean, it's like, okay, I'm ready. Wait, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And, and, you know, I'm sure you've heard him talk about that too. And he, 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 he'll say that the reason that song sounds so great and, and that um, he was able to get it so easily was because the rest of the band had played it so many times that, you know, he's such a humble guy. I love that about Steve. He'll, he'll say, well, you know, the rest of the band knew it. So we were able to go down and, and uh, you know, I think we, I think we played it twice or something. And I, I think they kept the first take, but um, yeah. Like you say, speaking of him being so humble, here we are. This is the Steve Gadd show now. <laughs> it's not my, it's, no, it's your show. It's your show. We we did a uh, uh, benefit for the lighthouse out at the end of uh, Long Island. It was Billy Joel was there, and um, uh, it was Paul Simon's thing, and yeah. and Steve was playing for Paul. They used my drum set, you know, uh, and it, it was at the time it had the three or four toms in front and everything like that. Every other band that came up there, they took the thing apart. They would you know, move things around and everything like that. Steve came over, sat behind the drum set just the way it was, picks up my sticks, which were logs at the time, and yeah. just starts playing. Like it's the, All he did was put a cup of gum on the, on the uh, monitor. You know, because he was chewing gum like mad at the time. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. giving up smoking too. You know, right? He's <laughs> like, he's like, now I got to stop chewing gum so much. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's a. I never heard that story. That's a great story, but that yeah. doesn't surprise me. Yeah, that he just come up just and sat just sat down. Yeah, just yeah. sat down. Didn't adjust anything. Nothing. And I said hi compared to how he sits. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's no he's great and it was his birthday the other day so we can we can say yeah. some nice things about him and we can we can yeah. but that's enough now that's enough <laughs> for crying out loud that is enough <laughs> billy billy Amendola says hello he wants to know what you had for breakfast i had oatmeal billy oatmeal and cranberries <laughs> that's why that's why you you haven't gained a pound probably in in 60 years no, that and I have a four-year-old that, that that's <laughs> get, making me old by keeping me young. <laughs> yeah, that'll do it. That'll definitely do it. Yeah. Oh, man. All right. Let me see if any. Oh, Paul Quinn, our friend Paul Quinn is here and he's saying lucky enough to do the pre-release v- review of Lib's book to take out the stuff that might get him sued. <laughs> I, you know, I, th- I thank him in there for keeping me uh, le- legit, you know, because uh yeah, there was stuff in there. <laughs> but I, I we sent it to Paul, and Paul wrote back. He goes, eh, "You might want to take this out. <laughs> you know, you might like want to take that out." Yeah. You know? So yeah. he kept it legit. You know, you, you talk about writing the book, and I don't want anybody to think that I I wrote the words in the book. I wrote the book. Yeah. But Joe Bergamini, come on, he was like him and 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 Rob. You know, Hudson Music, they, they were like the producers behind the glass where uh, Paul made sure it was everything was legal and, and nothing can happen. Even my life coach, I sent it to my life coach before it came out. And I said, can I get in trouble for anything here? And it was like one thing where I'm describing uh, uh, the, the, the way the, the, the World Trade Towers felt when me and Billy went to see them like eight mm-hmm. days after they fell. And I said, I felt like I I was raped. And she said, no, you can't say that because, you know, uh, uh, because you really are a man and you don't know what it's like for a woman to be raped, you know, and you don't want women coming after you and and saying like, hey, Mm. you know, and she was right, you know. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, I I mean, I think everybody would have known what you were trying to say, but I, but I, but she was right. You know, it's it's like, that's there. Yeah. That's their, you know. Yeah, that's I, I would, a, yeah. You know, never have. I would never want my sister or my girls or anything to go through something like that. And I couldn't even imagine what that must be like. You yeah. know. So absolutely. We, but well, that that's. It, I, I'm glad you mentioned Joe Bergamini and and Rob and 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 Paul, all those guys that were part of it. Because I I I, sh- I should have. I knew that they were. I knew that um, they were edit. Joe was an editor, and I should have mentioned that as well. Because those guys, they're the they're the. Uh, the backbone. They're the guys well, behind the scenes. The idea, you know, the way it is a chapter and then there's a thing on my drums. 
Yeah. Right. My drums. So, so you feel like the drums or how I feel about the drums as I'm growing with the drums. That was the longest chapter in the book. And it was Joe's suggestion to break it up and put it in between the other things. And it worked I out see. great. Oh yeah, it did. It absolutely, yeah. it was a, it was a cool little intro to each chapter. Cool little, right. yeah. Yeah. You find, you find yeah. yourself looking forward to this little section here. Yeah. Great yeah. idea. Good, good job, Joe. Yeah, Joe. Is he there, Joe? I I don't see him, but he could be. I, I he could be hiding. He could be hiding in the shadows. Joe, whatever you're writing with Steve Gadd, you better not make it as good as what my thing is here. <laughs> <laughs> He'll have hell to pay. I think I just saw one of my other bandmates. I just want to give I think I saw Neil Porter and I just want to shout out to him. I had a I had a dream about him last night that I'll Oh my God. I'll, Don't tell yeah. anybody about it. I won't tell anybody, but it, it, I've been having some crazy dreams lately, Liv. I, I don't know what it is, but well, I think I know what it is. But anyway, it, it was <laughs> this is a real doozy. I won't I won't tell you now, but uh, but but you you mentioned you mentioned those guys helping you know edit and and uh, and that was a one of the questions I wanted to ask you is did you have you must have had a ton of leftover material that you decided not to? I mean, you could have made this book twice as long. I'd have to think with with all the stories and everything that you've experienced. Well, I could have so, made it war and peace. You know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Every time when I'm looking at it just before I was looking at the Soviet union part and I know I missed the part. I don't think I put the part in there where the girl comes in my room and tastes peanut butter for the first time. You know, no, I don't think I remember reading that part. No. no. And she's disgusted by it. She thought it was the most disgusting. She comes in my room and uh, she says, Oh, cause we brought stuff. You know, they told us, uh, the the, uh, the Russian embassy and all that, they said, you should bring something to eat in between meals and something that you really like because food's going to be really different there. Uh, you know, bring water. Billy, they had skids of water sent to us and a and, uh, couple wow. of guys brought, brought, hot, brought hot plates to make food. <laughs> you know, uh, I ate everything that, that served though. But um, she came into my room and she saw the peanut butter and she says, oh, this is what um, Americans go crazy about. And I said, yeah, you want to taste it? Yeah. And I gave her a little spoon and she put it in her mouth. She tasted it. And she was disgusted. She said, this is, it was like trying Vegemite for the first time. You know, I don't know wow. if you ever had Vegemite. I've never she had Vegemite. It. Yeah. She hated it. You know, I can't, I, yeah. Yeah. Probably my all time favorite food, peanut butter. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a real go to. You know, it's, like, it's a real like go to. I don't feel a like turkey sandwich. Nah, I don't feel uh, peanut butter and jelly. Yeah. <laughs> Can't go wrong. Yeah. You can no. not, never go wrong. Yeah. 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 I, one time when I first moved out of my house and my first apartment, you know, when you, you that, when you first start to feel independent, you, one night I sat in front of my TV with a jar of peanut butter and a bag of peanut M&Ms. And I was taking peanut butter and putting them on the peanut. And then I just, that was that took too long, so I started dipping the peanut M and M's into the peanut butter, and I got about halfway through the bag, and I thought I was going to die. But yeah. I like <laughs> OD'd on it. But anyway, it was like that was to me like independence, and my mother would have never let me do that. Like, what are no, you doing? No. You know, it's funny. I wrote uh, when I when I posted this about this today. I wrote like this, the sauce will almost be done. The water will be getting ready to boil for your Sunday dinner. So this is, you know, this would be great to watch this and then go eat your Sunday dinner, you know. And so many people, and somebody asked, what kind of macaroni are you eating? And I said, rigatoni's. So many people like rigatoni's. They love rigatoni's. Yeah, that's kind of the go-to. Yeah, rigatoni's, yeah. I have a bowl of pasta. Uh, but when the large play, uh, Andy Gilmartin, who's our manager, goes and gets me a bowl of pasta before I play. I'll, I'll, that's it. I, it'll make a difference. You know? Wow. Yeah. I can, that's... I can, I can break things. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, you know, man, you're, you're, you're about to like embark on a, on a lot of energy being spent. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's the time to load up on those carbs, man. Yeah. yeah. It's a marathon. Yeah. yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. I, I think I was going to say, I, I, it must've been a, a PASIC, um, where I, I saw you playing to, to the Billy tracks and I, and I, right. I should have, I should have made mention of that earlier. Cause I, I thought that was great. I thought it was the perfect um, 
that's like Dom said, he, he knew intuitively, that's what people that come to see you want to see. But right. you could understand why you would have seen somebody else doing one of these things and thinking, oh, man, I got to I got to figure out a way to play some fast triplets and, you know, work on my double pedal chops. But who no when, when you come to see Liberty DeVito, they want to hear you play in those classic grooves and talking oh. about it like you do in the book so well, too, and like how you came up with this part. And those to me are right. the best clinics. I, I always I tell people now, I said, I'm not really a drummer when I look at those other guys. I just play one on stage. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do. Uh, you know, it's it's funny because everybody thinks that that fast is the best, you know, or yeah. somebody says, who's the greatest drummer ever? And, you know, it's like there is no greatest drummer ever. There is no greatest drummer right. ever. Everybody that's playing is it sounds great because he's in his element, you know, um, I always compare funny, but Buddy Rich and Larry Mullen from U2. Yeah. Right? You go see U2. Great. You love them. People are cheering, going crazy. You go see Buddy Rich. People are amazed at what he's doing. Right. OK. Right. Let's take Larry Mullen. And put him in Buddy's big band. <laughs> Man, that guy's boring. Oh, my God. He stinks. Yeah. Holy cow. Right? Oh, he was just great in the other band. Let's take Buddy and put him in U2. We got to get out of here, man. This guy's overplaying. He's driving me nuts. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like, <laughs> this guy's great because... Most first of all, this guy's great, and you think he's fantastic because you can't do what he's doing yet. Once right. you get to do what he's doing, he's like, Yeah, that's he's good. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, know? exactly. Yeah, you know, no, but you I, have to take that. You have to, you have to take, you know, uh, like I always say, like a good bar, a good drummers borrow, but great drummers will steal. I mean, now, one of my dearest friends invented a, a rhythm and has his name mentioned it, it the rhythm is named after him the purdy shuffle right yeah. it's yeah. how many drummers do you know that i mean bo diddley has a beat that, right. that he plays on his guitar it's the yep. bo diddley beat purdy has the purdy shuffle no other drummer has a that's the steve gad shuffle oh that's the no no Bernard's the yeah. only one yeah john bonham stole from bernard purdy yeah to do fool in the rain right Jeff Vaccaro stole from Bernard, uh, uh, John Bonham, who stole from Bernard Purdy to yeah. do Rosanna. Yeah. You know, but each one of them put their own fingerprint on it. Bonham put his own fingerprint on that and, and Vaccaro put his own fingerprint on that one, yeah. which made it theirs. Exactly. But basically... Bernard gave birth to those two guys, you know. Absolutely, yeah. And yeah. and if they were both alive today, they would they would be the first to say that too. Yeah, I, you know, it's yeah. Right. I, I, that that's that's a great that's a great um, analogy right there. A great example of like, yeah, there, there's there's really only one guy, like you say, drummer that has a beat named after him, and that's yeah, the Purdy Shuffle. It's unbelievable. I yeah. sat in a in a airport lounge with him for an hour. Before we were waiting for a flight. And he explained to me how he came up with that. It's there's a railroad tracks behind his house. You know? And he said no when kidding. he first started when he first started to play it in a band, yeah. The guys were saying, You're screwing me up, stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta get oh, him man. on this show. I know, I do, yeah. I do. I, I I will, you know, I, I don't know him well, but I've met him many times and he's a sweetheart. Yeah. It really is. As long as he doesn't talk about our other friend that and say that he played on those songs, but which he probably wouldn't, I don't think. But I don't, I don't, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 I don't know. I, I had to introduce him at a drum festival once. And I said, this man said he played on Beatles songs, but um, it really doesn't matter after all the things he actually did play on. As a matter of fact, I just found out tonight that he played on Just The Way You Are. It was <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> he was cracking up when he came out. Left that's, <laughs> that is hilarious. No, I know. I, and it, I feel the same way, Liv. It, it, it has, he, whether, what, you know, whether he says it or not, or whether it, there's any truth to it, it, it doesn't matter because he's, he's played on so many amazing songs. I mean, so, so many great, influential songs that 
um, you know, he I has believe, his place. I believe that somewhere there is a connection to the Beatles, actually, that he played on something that was connected, whether it be through the management, through whatever. Yeah. There's a connection there. That because or, he was doing so much work, he would go in and they'd, he'd hear something about this band from England. You're going to play on the stuff and then leave. You know, yeah, yeah. They were nothing, you know. Right, right. Yeah, the, I I thought the same thing that there was some offshoot of it or something that that you know it, that that in some way was connected. And uh, Billy saying it's the Atco tracks with Tony Sheridan. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. Could still very the Beatles, well be. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's Beatles. right. That's right. Yeah. But I, I just quickly want to, um, if I can tell a quick joke, and I'm not a good joke <laughs> teller, but I'll, I'll tell a quick joke. And you, you've probably heard this, but it's the world's greatest drummer joke. I don't know if you ever heard this. this. This kid writes a letter to the greatest drummer in the world. So it shows up at Liberty DeVito's house. Liberty gets it, says to the world's greatest drummer. No, man, that's that's not me. That's that's Steve Gadd. I, that, Steve's the greatest drummer. So Liberty puts it in the mail to Steve Gadd, shows up at Steve's house. Steve gets it. World's greatest drummer. No, no, no. That's not me. That's that's Buddy Rich. Steve mails it off to Buddy. Buddy opens, gets the letter. World's greatest drummer. Yeah, that's right. That's me. You better believe it. Opens it up. Dear Ringo. <laughs> yeah. It's an yeah. old one, but <laughs> you know, you know, Ringo, Ringo gets a bad rap all the time from people like he wasn't very good. And, you know, he's the luckiest drummer in the world. You know, if people ask me, did Ringo pave the road for you guys? I say, no, Ringo did not pave the road. Ringo took a tractor, went into a forest, knocked down the trees, dug up the dirt, then laid the, the, the cement first, then the gravel, then started to pave the road. He did all that before he actually paved the road for us. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I know. I know. Absolutely. And, and uh, I, I, I love how you talk about that. And, it, you know, it was like you saw them on Ed Sullivan and then that was a turning point. But then it was Dino Danelli that knocked him out of the number one spot because and I could see that because Dino had. He was he was like like a local boy. He was a you know yeah. an American New Yorker, and and like the Rascals were like the American Beatles at that time. They were just right. it, it was Ringo. Yes, I want to do that. I want to be in a band with all my friends. Dino, the drummer, can be as much of a focus as the lead singer is. Yeah, and then Carmine take that focus and put so much power behind it. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I think it's Jim Capaldi. I loved it. Traffic. Uh, you can hear in, in Stiletto where we play with Billy. Billy loved Traffic too. That's the first time I ever heard him sing, he sang a Traffic song with the band yeah. The Hassles, sang Colored Rain. And uh, you could hear in Stiletto where we do that. That's Traffic all the way. Yeah, know? absolutely. Yep. I, I, I never I never thought of that too until I read that part too, how the, the influence that, that you guys have from those guys. But yeah, you can can totally hear that. Yeah. yeah. He, was, he was a great underrated drummer jim capaldi yeah yeah, yeah. really good yeah, uh, my my wife worked for the rock and roll hall of fame for a while and when the um when traffic got inducted and uh i guess jim wasn't feeling well or something like that my wife said my my husband's Liberty devito and uh he's an admirer of yours and he turned to my wife and, and said liberty can't play what i've already forgotten and he walked away <laughs> Well, he must not have been feeling too good that night. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, all right. Well, Lib, it's, it's, boy, we're an hour and 20 minutes in, so I, I, I don't want to keep you too much longer. And, and it's, I, I told you before, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the macaroni. This has been so great, man. I, I've enjoyed this so much. And yeah, we had a lot of great folks watching, too, a lot of your, your friends and fans, for sure. Um, I just want to see if I, one more thing before, uh, yeah, take Joker. your time. All right. Oh, he's talking I, about Ringo. You know, when no, you we, started, when you started to joke, I thought it was going to start two drummers stop playing. Hey, it could happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a, there's a great, uh, there's a great bass player joke too, that it, that I, I, I won't take the time now, but it's a, it's, it's, it's good. It's, uh, <laughs> Oh, all right. Well, cool. No, I... 
<laughs> we should just do a thing on jokes. <laughs> we'll, we'll do another one of these just on jokes. Um, but I, I don't want to keep you any longer because it's Sunday and it's it's family time. And, and, and I so appreciate this. But if you want, you know, there's a lot of great comments here. If you want to go back and look at them and and uh, and and answer any questions that anybody might have asked.